I do three things to make sure that my brain is primed. And what I mean by primed is, most people think their thoughts are their thoughts, Lewis. Priming is a psychological principle where you think thoughts and you think they're yours, but very often they're created by the environment. So one example was Harvard has done multiple studies on this. And one of the studies they did was taking people, walking up to people, they hired two actors, they walked up to 100 people, they had to do the exact same thing, men and women, and what they did is they'd walk up with a cup of coffee in their hand, and they'd look at you and go, here, would you hold this for a second? And they'd look down and reach in their pocket to pull out their phone. And most people then take the coffee. There's nobody, there. you're not looking to give it back, right? And then they do what they're doing on the phone, they put it back in, they go, thank you so much, and they take their coffee back and they walk away. But then about 20 minutes later, if you're at a mall or a school campus or whatever, a person comes by with a clipboard and they give you $20 and they say, listen, I know this sounds crazy, but if you'll give me 30 seconds of your time, the $20 is yours. I need you to read two minutes of this, literally this little story, and then just answer three questions for me. Here's the interesting part. Half the people have a reaction, more than 80%, and half have a reaction 80% difference, and here's the question. They read the same story, but half the people are handed hot coffee, half the people are handed iced coffee. And the question they ask is, how would you describe the main character of the story after they read a few paragraphs? And the people who are handed hot coffee say the person is warm and genuine, 81% of the people, 79 to 80, 79.8, it's almost, it's a 1% difference, you know, natural variability, who are given the iced coffee say the person is cold and uncaring. Now, I could tell you 20 studies like that that would blow your mind how your brain is conditioned or primed by the environment. And think about all that's gone on with COVID of the last two years and how many people's brains live in fear. And in my new health book, I put in there just to remind people with COVID, outside being 80 years old, the number one, or having four or five comorbidities, number one factor, 80% of the people die of COVID, 79.8% are obese. That's something you can do something about. The second factor, according to the CDC, is fear. Because anxiety makes people get short of breath, they freak out, and their whole nervous system starts to go shut down. Your immune system can be shut down just by fear alone. And so this experience of life that we have, most people just don't understand that you are being primed all the time. And unless you prime yourself, you're gonna be primed by the environment, which most people understand that your brain right now is being conditioned and triggered whether you know it or not. If you're in any social network, it's being done continuously by algorithms. So I wanna take control of my brain. So I do three quick things. One, I take three minutes of those 10 minutes after I've changed my body and I focus on three different events in my life that I'm grateful for. I usually pick two big ones and one small one. It could be as simple as a smile on my daughter's face, uh, the wind against you know my skin, but I really, I don't like, if you've ever been on a roller coaster and you remember the roller coaster over there, it's not the same as remember going over the edge like you're there. So I do it in an associated <laughs> way and it changes your biochemistry. And now it sounds pretty you know, positive thinky, I'm gonna be grateful. But there's a value to it because the two emotions that mess up your business, your life, your relationships are anger and fear. And you can't be angry and grateful simultaneously. And you can't be fearful and grateful simultaneously. So by starting my day with that, and it's not some fake pump up positive thinking, they're real experiences. So it literally teaches your body to go in that state because otherwise the environment when right now, there's a whole deal, a lot of uncertainty and fear. Then real fast, I do this three minute process. It's kind of like a blessing. And then three minutes, the last three minutes are called three to thrive where I focus on three things I want to accomplish, but instead of thinking I want to accomplish, I see, feel, and experience it as done. I feel grateful, I celebrate it, and it trains your brain. So in 10 minutes, I'm done. Third thing that I'll do, I immediately send a message or a text or an audio message to somebody as a sincere compliment. And I don't go, dude, great job, or wow, you're cool. I say, hey, listen, I saw you on Tuesday with those kids and I saw you take that extra 20 minutes, no one else did. And I just want you to know, I saw that, I thought that was incredible. So I'm always very specific, mm. so they know it's not just some positive thinking bullshit call, it's sincerely right. doing it. It makes me constantly look for the good in the people I work with. Fourth thing I do is whatever I don't wanna do, the most challenging part of the day. I wanna go handle that problem, I wanna handle that issue. People that are scared to speak are thinking constantly, how am I doing? Am I good enough, am I strong enough? 
you'll never get confidence. Confidence comes from doing something so much. Confidence is tying your shoes, right? Confidence on Michael Jordan making a thousand shots before you take a break every single day, six days a week. So you look at Jordan or you look at, you know, LeBron or you look at anybody who's the best in the world at what they do and you go, aren't they lucky? But if you actually study them, you'll see they're doing things, they're practicing in private things that make them certain in public and they get rewarded for what they do in public. And you got to do the same. Biggest mistake, people think they're supposed to walk out and be good at it. And if they're not, they don't want any part of it. I don't want not look good, not be good because we live in this social media world where they compare themselves to people that are bullshit. You know, I got a friend that owns a gym and we laugh about this all the time. He says, Tony, at least two or three times. First time he told me, I couldn't believe it. But I, I saw it happen one time. I went to go pick him up. We were going to lunch and he goes, look at this. And these people would come out, a woman or a man, they both do it, and lay out all this stuff, take a million pictures of themselves, and then leave. They didn't do any workout whatsoever. That's the bullshit social media when filters on pictures. And so people compare themselves to not other humans, they compare to people others' bullshit story. And that's why so many people get depressed when they, you know, there's, I'm sure you've seen the studies, you know, the more time people spend on social media, usually the greater levels of frustration and anger and certainly depression for a lot of people have because you're comparing a world that doesn't matter, plus you're being reinforced by these algorithms in ways that go beyond your conscious awareness. to a muscle if you don't use it. We say you lose it, you don't actually lose it, but it gets weaker and weaker as you well know, right? And what happens the minute you start making demands on it, especially if you haven't made demands in a while, it doesn't take much to see real muscle growth, right? And so it's like if you, if you constantly live in fear, your world gets smaller and smaller and it tends to get more fearful. Like who's more fearful? Someone has broken 10 bones in their body and healed them as a kid or someone never broke a bone? You know the answer is. The kids that are overprotected are fearful all the time. But if you've gone out in the street and you know, you've gotten in a fight and you know, you busted your arm or your hand or finger or whatever, you played football or whatever the hell it is or boxed or something, it's like, now it's like, I'm not afraid of that crap because you've lived it. And there's no substitute. I always tell people a belief is a poor substitute for an experience. You think you know what China is, but I take you to China, you have a little different experience. And I remember turning 40, and I was really, really unhappy. I was like, Jesus, I've not done enough, I've not helped enough people. I know tens of millions of people at that point already had done all over the earth in 100 plus countries at that point, but it was still kind of stuck in my head. So I would earn the love by over-delivering, change somebody's life. like. I don't get it because somebody says, oh, I love you, Tony. I mean, I appreciate that. Or, oh, you're the greatest. It's got to be my standard. My standard's higher than their standard for me, right? So when I get up and someone's going to kill themselves and it's they're suicidal and boom, turn around, they're no longer not going to kill themselves, but they're transformed. Their life is there. You know, that's when I go, okay, you know, now we've hit the center of what I'm made for. Now, you know, I deserve to feel this euphoric feeling within myself and appreciation. And even then, I still know it's God coming through me. I don't have the delusion. It's just me. But I think sometime after 40, I finally saw the stupidity of it. And I accumulated enough that I looked at life with fresh eyes. And I can say by the time I turned 60 a year ago, I noticed it was interesting because my birthday, I didn't have an ounce of it. I was just like, you know, how could I at this stage of my life when I've had the privilege of serving so many humans in so many contexts, you know, from turning around, you know.
guy's going to kill himself with PTSD to helping kids turn around to getting kids off cocaine or adults to, you know, helping people build multi-billion dollar businesses from nothing. And when I've lived this long, I can't go by without hearing half a dozen stories a day or a dozen stories a day from people telling me how something I did changed their life. So it's not that I'm so smart now. It's just I've stacked it. By the way, though, stacking is the way you can do things. Most of us stack the negative. If you are really angry, it's not usually because it's just the moment. It's that it happened again. You know, it's like if you've ever lost it or overreacted to your kid or to a friend or a business or even within yourself, it's because it happened again. We hit this one, two, three, many point and then our nervous system overreacts. But what I've learned is you can stack the good. And but for example, if you're if you go into a state of really strong anger for more than five minutes, your immune system is suppressed between an hour and a half to two hours. That's a physiological fact. But no one had done any study. I started stacking good, like, okay, let me stack a dozen great memories, feel them, see them, experience them. And I felt this biochemical change that didn't just last a half hour, an hour or 10 minutes. It went on for a day or two. And so I think uh, I've learned to stack the good. So just having the experience is not enough. You gotta stack the good to be able to appreciate it. But I, I think, just come back to the main point here from my perspective, which could be completely full, just my perspective. So I wanna point that out. I think the more, you find unconditional love for others, the easier it is to find in yourself. And I think the focus is serving and loving, and that's what will get you to the point where you start doing it. But if you want to speed it up, stack all the good you've done, you'll feel great about yourself.